My name is David L. Noreen. I'm working for WILL-TV of the University of Illinois at Urbana, and this is also for the Veterans History Project. We're in Hoopston, Illinois at the Hoopston Public Library. Today is November 8, 2007. I'll be talking to Edward J. Layden of Hoopston, Illinois, about his experiences on the home front during World War II. Assisting me on lighting, sound, and camera is Henry M. Radcliffe III. And Mr. Layden, perhaps you could talk about uh, your date of birth and your experiences um, leading up to uh, World War II to start out with. Well, I was born May the 23rd, 1919. Uh, went to a one-room grade school out in the country, eighth grade, Goldsboro School. Uh, went, went to John Greer High School in Hoopston. After high school, I went to the no University of Notre Dame for one year but they got me mixed up with pre-med students and I didn't get along so well. So then I went to the uh, University of Wisconsin for a farm short course for two winters. Uh, <clears throat> then come back from, from that and uh, kind of started farming with my dad. Then I was drafted into the Army in, I think it was April the 24th, 1941. I had a shoulder that I had hurt several times playing football <clears throat> and then some other, times too, uh, and after I was in the army a short time, they it jumped out, come out of place, and they, they doctors would put it back and say, hey, you shouldn't be here, you know. And then it got the second time, the, the regiment that I was in, the uh, colonel, that was the 20, that was the 110th Infantry Regiment, it, and uh, he said, we don't want you, he sent me to the hospital. I told him up there they either operate on that guy and make him 100% fit or send him home. They gave me that choice, so I come home. At this time, the war hadn't started yet, right? This was still That's right. before this, the war. Yeah, I was discharged on the first day of November, and the war started May the 7th. And I went back to the draft board right afterwards, and they said they'd had notice from December 7th. December the 7th. Yeah. The, this colonel had sent them a letter that not to send me back to the army. <laughs> I don't. That's what the, the man, Charlie Dyer, who ran the draft board, he told me that one time. I suppose he did. I don't know. But, uh, so I was classified 4F from then on. And so then you came back to Hoopston uh, right. and worked on your family's farm? Oh, yeah. That's where I intended to spend my life anyway. You know, uh, I. Uh, Grandfather come around Hoopston in 1877, and then we lived out in that same community. In fact, I have a, a son who lives on the same farm now, today. Yes. And so uh, there was, uh, after the war started, at some point there was a prisoner of war camp established here in Hoopston. Well, correct? it really wasn't an established camp here. They were stationed someplace else, but they were moved here in 1944. Uh, had used to have 3,000 acres of asparagus to cut too, and that was a big project. In fact, my wife said she went to high school in Rossville. They used to let the high school kids out of school if they go cut asparagus in the afternoon. <clears throat> and, and this uh, was partly because there were big canning factories uh, at that time. Yes, there was, <laughs> there was two in Hoopston, one in Rossville, one in Milford, one in Fowler, one in Paxton, one in Gibson City, and I think maybe these prisoners of war went to several of those camps, but they all lived here in Hoopston during, during the canning season. And where was the prisoner of war camp? How, how was that set up? <laughs> well, it had been the, it was on the, what we call the farm headquarters, and back in the earlier days, you know, they'd have 500 mules doing the farm work, and so they had big barns and uh, some of them are still standing, and they just clean them out and rearrange things because the people would come in the middle of April, they wouldn't need much heat, and then they'd leave uh, way out. By that time, they were canning some tomatoes too, so they'd leave a few maybe to pick tomatoes, but they'd, they'd all be gone by the, before the 15th of October. Or it would just be summertime help, really, so they wouldn't need much help. But, uh, and I don't know how many prisoners were around here, there, there were lots of them, I'm sure. And they, they even worked in the factories too, so on, because mm -hmm. they'd march them up the street. 
Oh. So are you saying that the prisoners were only here for part of the year, or it was the, the workers that before the, the war that were just here? It would just be the prisoners was here during, uh, well, from about the middle of April until, until the middle of uh, October. And, and I assume maybe they, they would transfer these people back and forth to their main camp, may, maybe ship some of them other places. I, I don't, really don't remember that much about them. And so as it pertains to your family, uh, you, your family would have a truck and they would make arrangements to go and pick up a certain number of prisoners right. each day to help out. Yeah, you, you knew that you know, the day before what you were going to get. And the rule was that uh, you get 20 prisoners and one guard. So, so we had a, what we called a farm truck with, with just a, a, a grain truck with a, about a 8 by 12 bed on it. And they'd crawl in, you know, and... Uh, and uh, they, they soon figured out where they were going by who the driver was. You know, one of the things I remember about them real distinct is <clears throat> when you, you pull out on Route 9 and you turn the wrong direction, they say, no, 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 go to Chicago, go to Chicago. Mm -hmm. They learned how to say that. <laughs> so they would joke around with, with all you guys, quite a bit. Oh, gosh, yeah, they, they were, yeah. <laughs> And so uh, you would pick these prisoners up uh, very early in the morning uh, to yeah. work a full day's work, and then well, they wouldn't. No, you didn't work. You didn't work a full day. You'd usually be. You'd always be through filling filling the wagons up by, by noon, because the canning factory had to have corn to start, and then they, they had enough wagons that they could fill them up. Uh, uh, sweet corn, you had to almost pick it when it was when it was a little bit wet after the after the. Corn would get dry, then it was hard to pick that that, that ear off the stalk. It got hard, difficult. So you usually were wanted to be through. By, well, you like to be through by ten o'clock, but most of the time you'd be through by twelve, and and that's when the, all the women, you know, they'd uh, fix lunch and stuff for them, you know, and and what would the lunch be? <laughs> I thought that would vary from home to home, but they always had cookies and sandwiches, and uh, I think my, we used to milk a couple of cows, so, so uh, uh, my mother would make chocolate milk, that's because we drank chocolate milk at home, they, they liked that. Mm -hmm. uh, the first year we had uh, prisoners, uh, I think 14 days, and I remember them distinctly because they were in better physical condition than the average American would have been. Found out later that they, they were part of a Rommel's army that had been captured in Africa. And these boys were all about five foot nine or ten, up to about six foot two or three, you know, and very nearly the same age, uh, all in good, perfect physical condition, and knew, knew how to work. The thing I always remember about them, <clears throat> when uh, the average American would jerk corn, actually you'd jerk corn, uh, you jerk with both hands, and some people would jerk two ears off and throw. Most people would jerk four ears off, and throw because you get them between your fingers if you're strong enough. Once in a while, you'd find some that could get th three in each hand, six. And sometime when you had six, you could throw maybe one of them would, wouldn't get in the wagon. Well, well, the average American would forget about that one. These Germans, went, if one didn't hit the wagon, they wouldn't pick it up. They mm. didn't leave anything in the field. I remember that very distinctly. Yeah. Okay, and so did the prisoners have a, a second shift then that after they were done in the fields they no, would go to the canning no. factory or they would just yeah. return to the camp? Now the, the ones that worked in the factory, I don't know how they could, because see sometimes that factory would work all night. Uh, not usually would work, uh, always would work two sh shifts. You know, they, they start, usually start about, uh, well I think they used to always work uh, 15 minutes before they are, they started, you know, at quarter to seven, then they'd go off quarter to 12, and then come back at quarter to one, then start another shift. Maybe it, maybe they start that about four o'clock, and then they'd run till eight, nine, 10, 11 o'clock. Whatever was harvested in the day had to be canned that night, or they took it to the cattle pen to dump the corn because it, uh, it wouldn't fit the can the next day. Okay. 
So you did this over a period of time. There would be different areas of the field that you would successfully well, move through each We would morning. kind of plant the corn scientifically because we knew it take, took, take about so many days for the corn to mature. So we would plant sweet corn maybe a couple of days. And, and we par partnered up with, with a cousin of, of ours uh, whose father had died, and he farmed out in the community too. And in fact, he was one of the factory workers uh, uh, during, the, during the pack. They had to have a lot of help to make sure that the corn was on the way. But nothing got them more excited around the canning factory to have a bunch of people come to work and then two hours later run out of corn. You know, they, that, that just, uh, you know, you, <laughs> that, that was, uh, that, that was uh, rather a rather exciting time. If, if you weren't going, if, if there wasn't any corn on the way to be there in 15, 20 minutes, well, they'd, they'd ignore it. But then if it's going to be too long, they'd send them home and then bring them back an hour later. But they would, but, uh, but, but, yeah. But we had uh, prisoners the first year. We had 20 prisoners, and, and we had five tractors between us, and we could pull two wagons with a tractor, and then there'd be four, so there'd be four boys on a wagon. See, see. And, and of course, when you get that fourth row out, that's quite a waste on the wagon, but they would do their shift in, themselves, you know. One to take the first row and second, and then they'd shift back. Sometimes they'd go, uh, it all depends how long the rows are. Uh, Corn rows are a lot different lengths than, you know, than uh, people in town realize. There's quarter mile rows, and there's half mile rows, and there's three quarter mile rows, and there's some that would be only an eighth of a mile. So, but uh, but most of them were, were 80 rod or 160 rod, quarter or half, uh, half mile or, or quarter mile. Now at this time, uh, labor was pretty scarce, so having the prisoners <laughs> was really yeah, quite a blessing then. 19, uh, 43, we didn't have any help, you know, and we liked to never got it harvested. In fact, there was some of it that didn't get harvested. It was just, you know, it was just too much labor. And it's, and it's hard to tell until you get into the crop how good the crop is. You know, it would make, it would vary from yield to yield, year to year. Uh, from Well, back in that, those days, if we had three ton corn, that was pretty good. Two corn, two ton was the average, but the, but if you had something that only made a ton and a half, you know, you you, you didn't have to fill as, take as many wagons to the field to get that. See. So so it varied every year. And, so now when they would uh, pick the corn, they wouldn't bother to husk it, right? That would be done. Oh done, no, you, no, that you would just, be done at the factory. Yeah, that, so they're they, just they pulling just, the what they call cobs. jerk, jerk. Right. You jerk it off the stalk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we all call it. Jerks. You jerk sweet corn. You husk field corn. Mm hmm. Okay. And so these these uh, prisoners were fairly good workers. Then they they really welcomed the opportunity oh, to yeah. get out of the camp and, and work and, in the fields. Yeah. So. And they loved to get out in the country, and didn't want to go back after they got out there. Oh, it's too hot back. <laughs> they'd mm -hmm. like to sit, lay out in your yard all all afternoon if you, you let them. You know, it's too hot back in town. You know, but eventually they'd get in the truck and go back. Now you mentioned in your materials that at one time there was a young child about two years old. That uh... <laughs> well, that would be actually my first cousin's son, and we were probably at their at their farm. Let's uh, because here this little uh, Rick Layden, some of the people around town would know who he is. He still lives here in town, <clears throat> and he uh, he was a cute little <laughs> two year old doing the kind of a pesty one, and he was flirting with them, you know, and and they were flirting with him too, and one of them kind of caught him and picked him up and gave him a pat on the rump and <laughs> turned him back down. You could see that that he was had a tear in his eye or something, you know. And then so then he got to holding up his fingers and then I guess we, somebody figured out what he wants to know how old. Well, he was two years old. And then he kind of figured out what, what month was he? We figured that out. What month is he? Well, it, they were both about the same age. About the, he was about two years old that month or maybe the next month. And then they, somehow they figured out that he had a boy back in Germany that he had never seen that was born about the same time. See. So it was one of the one of the prisoners that could speak a little English that was able well, to explain <laughs> this to you. Or? After you've been around a little while, you didn't have to speak much English. You, you, you know, you learned to motion things and mm -hmm. like that. See, I don't. That, that first bunch they didn't speak much English at all. The ones that came in '45, 
they'd been prisoners longer, some of them, and uh, some of them had, had spoken some English. I mean, uh, uh, the ones in 44, they were all about the same age, and, or at least the ones that we had, I don't know. There was a lot of prisoners out there, so when you take 20 out of them, you know, uh, that's just a small fraction of what was out here. But in 45, the, uh, they, they kind of learned the system a little better, and they found out that the farmer we were, they kind of liked to be out there. <clears throat> and we didn't figure this out until afterwards that uh, we had a white birch tree in our yard. Well, you know, Germany's full of white birch trees, and there's very few, you don't see very many of them around Hoopson because we're too far south. You know, Germany's a lot farther north than we are. So they just kind of like that, you see. <clears throat> and then I'm the oldest. Brought back of, memories of being in Germany to see the birds. I'm the tree. oldest of eight children, see, and some of the, most of these kids, they, they'd have been around families too, you know. So here, I think my youngest sister was probably uh, I think 45. She would have been nine years, 44, eight years old in 44, nine and 45. My oldest sister just graduated from Illinois, you know, and she was still still around, you know, <clears throat> and uh, and they, they kind of enjoy, enjoyed that. I mean being up around the family. And, and, and the, like I say, the second year we got, so we could talk to them more because they understood it a little bit and, and it'd, it'd always be somebody <laughs> that can figure out what you're trying mm -hmm. to talk back and forth. I was kind of wondering how you figured out that, uh, that he had a son about the same age uh, well, that he'd never seen, the, the soldier had never seen his. He was trying to hold up his hand and somebody said, what, what, what's the holes that we held up to? Oh, yeah. He figured, yeah, figured that out, see. Uh -huh. and then, then when he was trying to figure out, so, so then we figured out. I think we figured out that eight was when Rick was born, you know. And that's when he figured out that he had a son. And then he, he could talk to. He was, he was talking German to somebody else that was kind of, that knew a little bit of English. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, it was rather difficult to do, but eventually, you know, you go back and forth a few times. Then you kind of figure out what they're trying to talk about. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I always I always remember remember that incident, you know, because it's a very touching touching and, incident. And but. also, my cousin Bob Bob Layden, that who was the father of this two year old, was a field man for the factory, and he's the one that drove around and to make sure that the proper help was here and the proper help was there, and the, and the wagon, wagons were getting loaded, and they'd be in town, but. They were like the nine o'clock or ten o'clock. They wanted to know all this stuff up and down, and they had back then. They had to do it just run back and forth in a car. <clears throat> See, and they'd figured out that 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 this Bob Layden, who was a field man, was related to us. You know, they they figured that out themselves uh -huh. <laughs> because because his wife would be helping, and then and my mother would be there, and then they'd be at our house, and there my mother and and and, and Bob's wife would be there, and you know. You know, they they figured things out pretty well, uh, just just about being around. See. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that there's only one guard for the whole. One group guard of, for twenty prisoners. And at times, would the there be, you know, different groups of prisoners that the one guard had to, you know, keep, try to keep track of all these people spread out all over you the know, place. You know, you never you very seldom saw the guard. He'd be off someplace, like I say. They, they say he was over under a tree asleep. You ask him where, where the guard, oh, he's over under the tree asleep. <laughs> you know, which that's probably where he was. But they, these people, they weren't about to leave. They never did the, uh, well, a couple of times maybe they've tried. I think they said three of them escaped one time. I don't remember that really. But, uh, and then I know the guards sneaked two or three of them out one night and took them to Watsika to a dance. Well, everybody got in trouble over that, you know, the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the guards and 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 the uh, prisoners too. The, you know, because somehow they got caught. Some I, I don't know how that was. There was a place in Dan in Watsika that had a dance every Saturday night. See. I assume some of these guards and the and the prisoners got you know kind of pretty well acquainted. You know, did the prisoners always seem to? Keep aware, be aware of where the guard was. You know, oh yeah, they they, would... they, he, he, they always knew where he was, or or most of them did anyway. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that I don't think they'd have gotten a car and gone with you if you wanted to take them someplace. I don't think they'd have, they'd have gone really. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Most of them wouldn't. I wouldn't say all of them wouldn't. One of the, one of the things I remember, they always won. When they got to the second, this has happened more the second year, when they'd be, uh, when there was people in there that could speak a little English, they always want to know how, how far to Texas. That, uh-huh. that was one of the how far to Texas. Well, we'd try to explain to them a thousand miles, and they say thousand miles. You know, being in Europe, thousand miles in Europe is <laughs> over th- three or four countries. Right. <clears throat> and finally, then, then, when, then, how big is Texas? Well, Texas is bigger than what it is from here to Texas. And see, they can't quite understand it. So one day, I just went in and found, found a map of the United States and took it out and was showing. Boy, they all wanted to see that. And then they, they were astonished that everything was so big and so far away. <clears throat> you know, and, and I found out after that I wasn't supposed to do that. You know, that was against the rules. This makes it so sound I, like you're helping them escape. So, almost. so I kind of got <laughs> a, a chewing out for that. But right. I, though they didn't say too much, but they said, don't be doing that. You know, that's against the rules. But... The second year, I had these same four boys for 19 of the 20 days, and three of them were, were real young kids. You know, you know, they couldn't have been 16, 17 years old. I suppose they'd been drafted late, <clears throat> and they had raised on farms in in, in uh, Germany. But in Germany, they were all what, 20 acre farms, and they milked five cows or six cows. <clears throat> you know, they didn't understand big fields like we had here and, and, and big equipment. I, I took them out to a machine shop and was showing them our, our corn planter and our cultivator and they just, you know, <laughs> they just shake their head. You know, they, they couldn't believe that we, see, and that, even that equipment is, is just, it's, today is so obsolete, we, we wouldn't even bother to take it home for. Yeah, but uh, they, they were really inquisitive about the things that went on. So, so you mentioned that a lot of times it's probably different groups of prisoners that you get, but then sometimes there'll be the same group of prisoners that work on the farm day after day, and yeah. you kind of get to know them more. The second year, the group that come out the first day, and then there was another group the second day, but the third day it was the group that came out the first day. And from then on, for the tw- we had them 20 days that year. From then on, it was that same group of 20 boys. They figured that out that they like to be out there, our farm, and and also uh, my cousin's farm too went up there. But they liked they liked that white birch tree because that's where they wanted to go sit and rest under the white birch tree. Hmm. Now, did they have to wear special uh, prisoner of war uniforms or? Yeah, they uh, wore they wore a special uniform, but I can't remember what. I was just wondering if they did PW something. I think it had a number on it. PW number. Hmm. Yeah. If they did try to escape, they would probably be recognized very yeah. easily unless well, they, they somehow would, had they smuggled. They would have to uh, steal some clothes someplace right. real quick, or they'd be recognized. Yeah. Right. But then back then, everybody was washing clothes, hanging them outside in the summertime. So, mm-hmm. You know, if they were around town, they could. Find. But I, I don't know how they could have got out of Hubston very easy. Because everybody knew who they were. You see the camp, if they were out by themselves, <laughs> they would know something was wrong. Mm-hmm. But I don't think most of them would even want to, would want to escape. You know, they knew they were here and, and what, life wasn't too bad. They, when they worked, they got 80 cents a day to, to spend for cigarettes and pop and whatever else they, they could get, see. And uh, when they didn't work, they didn't get anything. The farmers, the government charged the farmers the prevailing wage for jerking the corn. See, but and, but they took off, take care, took care of all that. You didn't handle any money. The government and the candy factory would uh, settle up with them. Mm-hmm. So on on your farm, besides uh, helping with the corn harvest, did they do other work as well, or? No, that's the only thing they've done for us is sweet corn. Mm-hmm. But I knew that I knew a lot of them cut asparagus, uh, and and it was uh, <clears throat> I don't what they done between the asparagus pack and sweet corn. There's always a, a gap of about six weeks between uh, uh, the end of the asparagus pack and the uh, sweet corn pack. I I don't know what they. I suppose they just lay around camp, or maybe they take them back to. 
to the other where they come from in the first place. Some of them used to stay at Fort Grant, Camp Grant, up, uh, northern Illinois. And then there was another camp around Peoria, I think. But, but they they really, uh, you know, they saved the crop in 44 and 45. Guys, it was a, it, it, we went through that harvest easy, you know, from the farmer's standpoint. All we had to do is drive the tractor. Now, was there any competition among different farmers to get the German prisoners work, or did they just bring no. down the number of uh, prisoners that were needed for all the farmers that well, had a harvest that, that they wanted? I'm sure there was a lot on. of negotiating done between the people at the canning factory that were arranging for this and, and the government somewhere. There had to be some mutual agreements as to how many you would need. And, and like I say, I think they went to five or six different places canning factories to, to help can corn. So they pretty much knew what they needed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are in that business could figure that out pretty quick what they would need. Another thing I remember about them though that they always wanted to smoke. They stop at about every end or maybe in the shorter fields they'd go around but they'd have to stop and smoke. <laughs> I think every one of them smoked. Yeah. And see it back in those days. Well I guess maybe I smoked a pipe once in a while back then but my, my brother Tom, who was home too, uh, he never, he, he always brags about how he quit smoking when he was 14. See. Hmm. But these, these boys always wanted a cigarette. Now you mentioned that you also had a, a second story too um, uh, when we were talking on the phone. Oh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> my father had an older brother who had gone to the University of Illinois and got a law degree and went to Oklahoma to live in 1910. And, uh, uh, and he used to come back every summer because uh, his wife's family was here and, and his parents, my dad's, my grandfather was out. So he'd come up here. But he always take the month of August off from his, from his law practice. And he used to do a lot of traveling. But then during the war when gas was hard to get, he could get enough gas to get to Hoopson because he knew my dad would have some extra. He had the coupons, you know, that you could hand, hand the out. Gasoline to rationing coupons. Yeah. You, and you didn't because of the hand, farm, you would have had. You didn't want to hand out too many because they didn't give you really too much extra, but then they, get, always, managed, they always managed to get farmers enough to do what you had to do. Mm -hmm. And you'd have a sur few surplus. Uh, anyway, uh, the second year he came, First, for, he left, you know, and then he come back. And they were still here for a couple of days, and he thought, "Boy, they're interesting to be around." So the second year, he got here before the pack started, and he was out there every day. He stayed with my, my with his sister, my aunt, uh, out there every day, and he got to talking to those boys every day, you know. And he found because some he knew he knew some German then, so he could. And he speak, he spoke a little bit of German. He'd gone to Greer College. Uh, here that was here in Hoopston back in, I think, I think uh, he probably he was born in '85, so he probably that was probably about two, 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 or 1905 when he was was going to Greer four and five, I suppose. I don't I don't know exactly when, but anyway, he could speak enough with them, and he found some of those boys that were pretty well informed. You know, he'd like argue with them. They they there'd be three or four of them in the corner and talk them. Well, I finally discovered one boy that was from Frankfurt, Germany. Well, my, my cousin Bill had been with Patton's army, and he'd gone across Germany, you know, just, like he says, faster than you could run, uh, and was stationed near Frankfurt. When Uncle John found this guy, found him then. He wrote to, to his son and told him to go into Frankfurt and look up this boy's parents and tell him that, that he, he'd seen his son out on on his uncle's farm and, and uh, hmm. help him with this harvest of crop and Bill's a, he wrote back and said, nothing to do with those dirty so-and-sos. This was in August after the war had ended in May. And then, then a year and a half later, Bill got, I don't know how he got to stay in Germany, but he got charge of a PA, PX over there. So he got to stay in Germany and he met this German girl and he married her and brought her home about a year and a half later. And that's, he wouldn't have nothing to do with it. 
<laughs> Wouldn't have any, anything to do with the Germans until he married one. Huh? And then she had a younger brother who went to med school and come back, lived in Chicago and practiced medicine in Chicago all his life then afterward. And she fit in, of course, my family, mostly all Irish, you know, and, and the, you don't mix with the Germans too much when you were Irish back, way back then, you know, but uh, she mixed right in, you know. She, I mean, she had four kids and a lot of them still in Oklahoma, the same place, practicing law. My uncle had sons and grandsons and probably great-grandsons, probably, probably in that same law firm. We've kind of lost track of them because they've all passed, passed on, you see. So what other kinds of conversations did the lawyer have with the, the prisoners? Um... Oh, they were talking about things that would, would be happening. Now, he was better read and listened to the radio more than I did. I mean, I don't know what they were... They were discussing things that uh, political issues of the day and, oh, and yeah. things about oh, the war oh, and the yeah. philosophies of the yeah. two countries and yeah. They seemed to have they seemed to be having a good time doing it. I mean they you'd see them throw their hands up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Another thing I remember one time that I don't know how this got started, but somebody started asking them, what, what were you in the army? Well, one of them was this and one of them was this and you know, they tell you what, what part of the army they were in. And one of them said, secret weapons. And all the, all the PW, <laughs> oh, secret <laughs> weapons. <laughs> was he they, not supposed to say that? Was that supposed no, to no, be they a... just, they, they just, they figured out there is no secret weapons anymore. <laughs> but this boy, he, and then they, they, they were jabbering to him in German, you know, and then they, <laughs> then they say, he hadn't woke up yet. <laughs> But the, I remember that they just yeah, they give him the, the raspberries because uh -huh. he, he was a secret white, but he wasn't going to tell them what he did. <laughs> so how the, how long did the lawyer visit for then? Uh, well, he when, he was there. They were, these boys were there twenty days the second year, and he was here when they got here, and he was still here when they left. Oh, okay. So he was out there every day visiting with them. And I don't know how long he'd been here when he discovered this one boy from Frankfurt. I don't know, somewhere in through there. When he went back, uh, <laughs> when he sent the letter back, and then we got word back that I think probably that they, the PWs even left probably before we got, got word back that uh, that Bill had answered. Because back then, mail didn't, doesn't travel like it does today. <laughs> and uh, But we found it out after, you know, that. He, was, he wasn't going to see this boy's parents. Mm -hmm. So did the prisoners ever get, get mail while they were in their uh, prisoner of war camp? Did, did, you know, did it I seem like they were able to keep in touch at all with things back in Germany? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know whether they did or not. I assume maybe they did. Now, there's one thing that I do remember uh, talking about two or three of these boys that could speak a little bit of English. They were surprised when they landed at New York, and this, this was a group from, from 45, I think. Because, like I say, the group from 44, they didn't speak a whole lot of English, and they were all this, these German, they had been in Rommel's army, and we communicated a little bit, but not near as much like we did the one in 45. But these, these people that come, come in New York in 45, they were surprised that there was any buildings still standing in New York. They'd been led to believe that New York was pretty much leveled off. And, hmm. So this was, this was propaganda that, uh, Ger that Germany had been bombing New York oh, City yeah. for quite some time. Oh, yeah. And that yeah, it yeah. had been reduced to rubble. And, and a lot of these boys had already come to that. The, yeah. Well, even in, even the ones in '44 had realized that the war was over as far as they were concerned. They just will quit because they knew they weren't going to win anything. And actually, these boys that were captured in Africa, I don't know where they were before they come to America. I guess we never talked about you know, We didn't talk about things like that you know, uh, that I remember of. Mm -hmm. All I remember, they were they were men. I mean, they 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 could take care of themselves. And so, the prisoners always had the um, impression of being very well fed and very well taken oh, yeah, care of. Yeah. That 
And I think they got fed pretty well at the camp here. I don't know. Uh, they, they'd always bring a lunch with them. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember uh, what they were eating, really. Now, I, I assume that they had breakfast before they left. I don't know. I don't remember talking to them about that. And so there were never never any problems at all with them as, as workers because they were so happy to be out of the camp and, and earning oh, the extra Oh, yeah, money. they liked that, that 80 cents a day. You know, that gave them pretty good spending money, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and they didn't like to go back to town because it was going to be hot. Those, those old barns that the mules used to stay in with, was all sheet metal. You know, it'd be hot inside there. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a whole lot of shade around, around in there. I don't know. They, they, they'd rather stay out in the, in the country where there was trees. Mm. And then I think I, maybe I told you about the family that lived right south of the, where the, what we call the prison camp. That was the old Joan of Arc farm headquarters. It was a family of the name of Schuler that run a, had a big greenhouse. And, and both of these people were German people. And they could speak German. I don't know whether I don't know whether they were born in Germany, but but I know they they could speak German. And and these boys would line up along the fence, and they'd visit a lot every day. Mm -hmm. Now now Mr. Schuler wouldn't because he was always working in the greenhouse. He's one of those people that that you work daylight or dark, you know. Uh, but but uh, Mrs. Schuler, she'd be out there visiting with them. They knew who she was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that at the. Uh, program we had here before, there was a, a man here who was about 10 years old, and I don't remember all the circumstances, but he lived along the streets or someplace where they, where they used to march back and forth, and they, they would sneak him in, and they, he'd play cards with them down at the camp. He remembered him real well, because I think his dad worked at the factory, and, and he had he went to school, probably at Lincoln School, with Lincoln the Lincoln School's torn down now, but that's, they, that's where they would go by every day, going from the camp to the factory, the ones that worked in the factory. And th this boy, he'd follow along with them. Said, said he learned the German card games. Now, I think he was profiled in a News Gazette article a while back, right? Was Because I think I've read that yeah. uh, story. I think he was about 10 years old. Uh -huh. so. Yeah, it could have been, yeah. Well, the, I, I get the News Gazette. I don't know, remember reading that, though, maybe. It was like some some days I missed part of it again. Oh, well, they worked out real well, you know, except uh, the man by the name of Camel, who had been a German prisoner, and he didn't get treated so well. He's written a book about his diary, you know, and, and uh, said there were days that he had nothing, no food or water all day, you know. And they were, this is when the... Americans were coming and the Russians were coming and the Germans were trying to keep them <laughs> out of the way, you know, trying to keep them away, you know. <clears throat> and they, were, they didn't know where they were marching, but they just marched, get going, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, this camel, when he found out that his mother had been feeding them too, he, he, he almost cried here at that program. <laughs> you, know, you fed those <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> They were starving me to death. I'm sure if you could interview one of the, some of those boys, they'd say, oh, we were, they were treated pretty well. Mm -hmm. But we got our crop harvested, too. We were thankful to get our crop harvested. So it worked out very well for all parties, the canning factories, right. the prisoners, the farmers. In fact, um, even, even the asparagus was probably harder to harvest because it was all hand labor. I don't know if you ever... You've probably ne never never seen an asparagus field, but no, so. see, it only gets up about so high when you you have to bend over and you break it off or you cut it with a knife. I mean, they've they've tried to harvest about every way you can, except it's 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 hard to harvest with a machine. You can you can you can harvest it with a machine, but uh, you can't eliminate the sand. And when when you harvest it with the, and get the sand in the in the can then the people don't like the asparagus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why it moved out of this part of the country, different parts of the country where they can harvest with machines and, and without getting the sand in. I mean, I don't, there, there's a, 
because I know there was a, more than 3,000 acres of asparagus within 25 miles from where we're sitting right now at one time, big circle around. Well, this has been a very interesting story. Do you have any concluding comments or anything you'd like to <laughs> add at the very end here? Uh, well, I guess the only thing that I think about is, boy, I wish I'd have just kept track of two of those boys because my, my wife has a has a younger brother, or no, I guess he's older than she is, that was stationed in Nuremberg at the, after the end of the war. He, he, had a, he and his two of them had farm deferments until uh, the war ended, and then those boys, their farm deferment expired, and they had to go serve for a couple of years while well, other people were being discharged, and they were stationed at Nuremberg, and, and her brother married a girl from Nuremberg. And they lived in Rawlsville, now living back in Nuremberg now. In fact, he was here during the month of month of uh, September. They come over back every year for the month of September, you know. And uh, but I wish I could have looked up two of those boys, <laughs> or one of them anyway. Guy. Mm -hmm. Now I understand there's been a, two or three of them that have come back, and they always look for a man named Baz Sims. Used to, well, Baz Sims was the field man for the for the canning operations. And he's the one that assigned, you know, 20, 20 in this one, 20 here, and 20, how, you, how they went out. But uh, uh, he died years ago, but they were look, always looked for him. But they remembered him. Has anyone ever contacted the library here or a Chamber of Commerce? Uh, any Germans uh, asking about this town, you know, that, anything like that? Uh, uh, you know, I really, I don't know. Hmm. I'm sure. I'm sure there's been probably more than that come back. Uh, one, this one lady that lives in Hoopston now that's kind of looked up the history of the PW, and I think she works for the News Gazette now, feature stories or something. I have to ask my wife what, what, her, what her name is. I don't know. But you know, I always thought it was funny that they didn't look up my brother Tom and I. We were, well, with them every day. No, well, not almost every day, you know. But nobody seemed to be paying attention to it. In fact, there's another fellow here in town that's a year older than I, who worked for the canning factory as a field man too, that could tell you, tell you all kinds of more interesting stories than I could tell you. But he's in the nursing home out here, and I don't think his mind would could help him <laughs> could help you much. You know, he's a year older than I am, but um, he he'd worked there for. He was a farmer and then worked part time for them. You see, and. Uh, he could tell you all kinds of interesting stories. Mm -hmm. And my cousin could have too, but then he died 20 years ago too, you see. Well, we're very grateful for your participation. Well, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> Hopefully there will be some follow-up on this. And okay. Have other people get a chance to hear your story as well. Okay. Thank you. And I can move my feet now? <laughs> you can tap away. <laughs> I don't think I tapped any, did I? No, I don't think you did. <laughs>